Hi everyone, it's Joanna, and today's video is going to be all about parabens. Now, I recently posted my morning and evening skincare routine videos, and several of you noticed that I used products with parabens and expressed some concern. So, I thought this is a very relevant topic. It seems to be this is a, a you know, issue that people continue to debate over, and I thought I could use this time to share with you an informed look at parabens. Now, before any of you guys in the firm anti-paraben or firm pro-paraben world jump down my throat, I do want to say that this video, I'd really try to be unbiased and totally neutral and look at all the research that I could find just to see what is the consensus on parabens out there. So, again, I'm really trying to be unbiased here, so please don't jump down my throat. Now, with that being said, let's get into the video. Okay, so first of all, what are parabens? Well, they are basically cheap preservatives that are found in over 75% of our personal care products. They're also found in many food products, particularly those that are kind of processed, like processed jams or sauces and stuff like that. So parabens have been around since the 1950s and have been commercially used pretty widely since then because they are a cheap way to keep all the bacteria and microbes and other nasty stuff from growing in our jars of beauty goop and other things. So just imagine, especially if you like to use, you know, creams that are in a jar, the continued kind of putting of your dirty finger into that jar would certainly cause a bacteria outburst if it weren't for the fact that there are probably some parabens or other forms of preservatives in there to make sure that that does not happen. Now the word paraben actually refers to a whole family of these compounds and they have names like methylparaben, propylparaben, isopropylparaben, butylparaben, etc, etc. So there is not just one kind of paraben out there, there are many many of them. And taking a look at my CeraVe PM lotion and my CeraVe hydrating cleanser, these two parabens, the purple paraben and methyl paraben, are both in there, kind of the third to last and fourth to last term. So they're pretty much all the way down at the bottom of the ingredients list. Okay, now, should you be afraid? Frankly, science suggests that it's okay at least for now. So that is a big caveat that this is something that is not conclusive, but at least for now there has been nothing suggesting that this is something that we should actually fear, at least in the dosages that is commonly found in the products that we like to use. So all around the globe, different drug and food safety regulatory bodies like the FDA or the European Commission have okayed the use of parabens up to a certain percentage in our products. I know sometimes you read on different websites, at least in my recent bout of research, I did come across this where it says the EU banned parabens in 2012 or whatever, and this is frankly misinformation. I don't know what the source is, who's saying it. I mean, it's certainly true that over the years the European Union has limited the use of certain types of parabens, but nowhere at any point in time did the European Union ban outright the whole family of parabens. I mean, parabens are definitely present in products that are sold in the EU. So that is just a flat out lie if that's something that you're seeing on the internet and are like, why isn't the FDA doing what the EU is doing? So just FYI, that's misinformation. None of the regulatory bodies have flat out banned parabens, particularly not the two that I mentioned, methyl and propyl paraben, because those are quite commonly used. So where does all this fear come from? Well, it does seem to be rooted in a 2004 study published in the Journal of Applied Toxicology that found in cancerous breast tissue the presence of parabens. Now that does seem scary, right? I mean, yikes! Cancerous breast tissue, parabens, I mean, we should be afraid! Well, even the researchers of that study have clearly stated that the media misrepresented what was actually found in the study, and in fact, quote from the researchers themselves, no claim was made that the presence of parabens had caused the breast cancer. So that is the critical point here in that this is a classic case, it seems, of correlation versus causation. And there was no way to prove that the parabens had caused the breast cancer. And this is something actually that journalists very, very frequently mess up. 
And I think it was really from this study that this other statement that I often see kind of quoted on the internet comes from, and that is that 99% of cancer patients or breast cancer patients have parabens in their system. Again, that is such a fear-mongering sentence because more likely than not, 99% of all of us have parabens in our system. They're in 75, over 75% of the products that we use. So it's pretty hard to avoid, even if you are doing your darndest to avoid them. So I'm not, I would not be surprised if most of us have parabens in our system. Does that mean that we're all gonna develop breast cancer? This is the clear fallacy of logic. Can't make a causal claim just based on some simple correlation. You can make a causal claim when there is a statistically significant difference between a population that is exposed to whatever versus a population that is not exposed. So in the case of smoking, for example, there was a clear statistically significant difference between populations that smoked or were exposed to secondhand smoke and the incidence of lung, mouth, throat, tongue, etc., different types of cancers versus the general population that did not smoke. So in that case, that was how it was proved that there was a causal link between smoking and those forms of cancer. And quite simply, there just hasn't been this causal link proven for parabens. And a lot of studies have been conducted to try to see if this is true, and that is the fact. At least at the current doses for our exposure to paraben, there does not appear to be any kind of causal link between parabens and cancers. Now that is kind of the history, but I did want to make sure that I wasn't, you know, overlooking any recent updates on this particular topic. And lo and behold, in 2015, there actually was a study published by some University of California Berkeley scientists that had some interesting findings with regards to parabens. So their study was, they claim, different than most other studies because they actually looked at parabens in concert with some other molecules that are typically found in our bodies that you know also support the expression of cancer in our cells and basically what they found was that parabens in combo with some of these different molecules actually did seem to have a statistically significant impact on the expression of cancer in the breast cells now this is definitely a very interesting finding, but even the authors of this 2015 study and their kind of scientific peers have flatly stated that while the study was interesting, the results still do not prove a causal relationship because this study was looked at in cells in a petri dish. It was not looking at populations of people, and frankly, both the scientists and scientific peers of the study have stated that this does not prove a causal relationship because the human body and the biology of the full human body is so different from what they demonstrated in the petri dish in this particular study. So it's impossible to say that there is a clear linkage, even if in this particular case, there did seem to be some statistical significance to the expression of those breast cancers. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting, and this is something that's definitely new as of, you know, late 2015, which I hadn't seen previously when I had looked into parabens back in the day. But given this new information, I still think, you know, there isn't reason to suddenly be terrified. I mean, perhaps if you have a history of breast cancers in your family, maybe you could be a little bit more cautious in terms of your exposure to parabens. But for the rest of us, the general population that doesn't have this kind of history, I still don't see any kind of causal proof. Now I was also just curious to see if at a high level there was any kind of correlation that I could draw just looking at some of the statistics on breast cancer historically. So I actually went to the American Cancer Society page and just looked up some information on the incidence rate of breast cancers. And so this chart here is the incidence rate of breast cancer from 1975 until 2012. Now, first of all, your reaction may be, whoa, Joanna, from 1975 until the mid-90s, it seems like breast cancer is on the rise. And isn't this also correlated with the use of parabens? I mean, doesn't that seem to be a causal link? Sure, that could be, but actually even the American Cancer Society states that this increase from 1975 to the mid-1990s is really attributable to the increase in the use of mammogram technology, such that during this time, the diagnosis of cancer actually increased just because we had the technology to diagnose. So basically, any rise from 1975 to the mid-1990s that you see on this chart, we can just kind of ignore because there is another clearer 
causal link there between technology and the diagnoses of cancers. But looking at 1995-ish until 2012, you can see that it's pretty much flatlined in terms of the incidence rate of cancers. And probably during this time, actually, the use of parabens increased, particularly from, I would say, the mid-90s until the mid-2000s. In about the mid-2000s, there was a backlash on parabens due to that study that I mentioned earlier, published in 2004. And so there was some consumer pushback on the use of parabens, which actually slowed parabens in, in terms of our uh, exposure. Yet, looking at the data from the mid-2000s to, like, 2012 that's shown here, it doesn't seem like there's any slowdown in the incidence rate of breast cancer. So this is why it's really hard to prove that there's some causal link between parabens and breast cancer, because looking at just this high-level view of this data, it does not seem to be the case. So again, this is a very high-level, non-scientific look at the data, but I thought it was interesting to share just to show kind of the big picture in case some of you were getting too boggled down by the by the small picture and like fears around parabens because looking at the big picture it doesn't seem like there has been any significant increase and probably you know this incidence rate of breast cancer is just normal i mean certainly there are things that all of us could do to reduce our carcinogenic risk but honestly so many people get cancers now because we are as humans living far longer than we have ever lived historically. I mean, like back in the caveman days, I think our average life expectancy was around like 30. I'd be dead, guys. I would not be alive right now. I would have already had 10 babies, nine of them would have been dead, and I would be dead. So this is not our reality today. And today, you know, our life expectancy is like 85, 90. I mean, I don't even know what the average life expectancy in the US is, but it doesn't surprise me really that cancers of all forms have increased particularly because so many of us are living so much longer and it's kind of our body's natural way to to shut us off unfortunately and that sounds really morbid but i think it is there's a lot of truth in that and obviously a lot of things can contribute to it but at least when it comes to parabens it does not seem to be clear that this is a clear contributor to breast cancers all that being said this doesn't mean that you should go out and go rub yourself all over with parabens. I mean, everything in moderation, right? Eating bacon is safe, but that doesn't mean that you should eat bacon every single day for every single meal, and that's all you eat because you'd probably be having a heart attack by the age of 30. So even though parabens in small doses are safe, we should still try to avoid exposure in large quantities because we honestly don't know what could happen. We don't have enough data to support anything one way or the other. So you might as well be safe and try to limit your exposure. When it comes to beauty products and particularly my skincare products, I mean, the paraben exposure is so limited that I'm not hugely concerned. I would say probably uh, if I had all products that had parabens like top of the list in terms of ingredients, then I would be like, whoa, slow it down there. But at least for what I'm using, most of my products do not have parabens and I'm not too concerned that these two CeraVe products that I do use do. All right guys, that is it. So I hope you found that useful and can go out there and make a better informed decision about your own purchasing habits. I don't think there's any need to go rush out right now and dump all your products if they have parabens, but at the same time, it doesn't hurt to, you know, all things being equal, choose products that don't have them. For, again, for me, with CeraVe, I will continue to use it because I love it and I don't believe that there is a linkage that will concern me enough to just go out and stop using these products. If I do find other products that are better and also don't have parabens, then by all means, I'm happy to go try that out in the future, but at least for now, I'm not planning to dump out anything that I have. Okay guys, that's it for me for this video. So. I will see you guys next time. Don't forget to subscribe and also join me on Instagram. Alright, see you guys.